Hey everyone, in today's video, I will cover the best katana build you can use. For my usual reasoning, it's taking out the most challenging bosses extremely quickly, facing little to no difficulties at all. And the best part about this is it's even more effective than a Moonveil or a Rivers of Blood focused setup. Believe me, those were my first two weapons I jumped on when building this. They're okay, they're just not as effective in terms of damage and general use. So now, let's dive into the build and start it off with the best katanas to have. So the best one we can use in our offhand is the Nagakiba. Regarding the affinity we place on it, we have two options that work amazingly well. The cold version or the bleed version. Now with either one you choose, you'll have a good amount of buildup. 105 for frost and 115 for bleed. Despite that, it's still going to take quite a few hits for us to proc either one of those effects. However, this is where the Ash of War comes into play, repeating thrust. Your character does a 360 before lunging forward 4 times, with each hit stacking up whatever status effect we have on. Thus, we can proc them with about 1 or 2 Ash of War attacks, which is really nice for it not only doing decent damage by itself, costing only 7 mana to use, and activating whatever status effect we want. It also works great with the Nagakiba because of its immense size, giving you much more reach with it. Now you're probably thinking, okay, that's cool and all, but what status effect should I use then? The difference between the two is very subtle and mainly depends on what kind of playstyle you like to use. Cause with the cold affinity place on it, after we proc a freeze buildup, it takes a chunk of the target's health away, not as much as bleed though, and makes that enemy take 20% increased damage for 30 seconds. So you, your teammates, if you're playing online, and Spirit Ashes will do more damage. And the thing is, this isn't even our hardest hitting attack either. We have another weapon that can do a lot more damage. With the Bleed Affinity, we can proc a Blood Loss with the same amount of attacks since they have roughly the same buildup. The activation of it does more damage while giving us a 30% damage bonus for 20 seconds. It sounds like a no brainer going with the Bleed option. However, the weapon in our main hand can also proc a Blood Loss very quickly getting us the same buff. The bleed affinity gives us a 30% attack boost much sooner with more initial damage, whereas the cold affinity gives everyone 20% increased power and lasts 10 seconds longer, all while being able to stack the 30% boost on top for a total of 50% increased damage. As I said, there's no right or wrong answer, both work exceptionally well in most situations. Furthermore, that 30% damage buff actually comes from two other items we use. The White Mask giving us a 10% increased attack power whenever a blood loss happens near us, and the Lord of Blood's Exultation doing the exact same thing with a 20% buff instead, both lasting for 20 seconds. The benefit is that you can use the Cold variation when dealing with enemies immune to bleed builds, and the same can be said for enemies resistant to freeze buildups. Saying all of that, I'll show you guys where you can find all of these items. With the Nagakiba, this can be dropped by the Bloody Finger Hunter, Yura, located north of the Murkwater Cave. If you choose to finish his questline, that's another way it can be picked up along with Eleanor's Pole Blade and the Purifying Crystal. Just takes more steps. Beforehand, you can grab the Ash of War Repeating Thrust that's rewarded after defeating a Knight's Cavalry boss that roams the bridge near the Aegeal Lake and only spawns during the night. Next, you can grab the Lord of Blood's Exultation after defeating Eskar, a Blood Priest in the Liondel Catacombs. Finally, for the White Mask, you'll have to kill one of the three Nameless White Mask invaders that spawn in the Mogwin Dynasty mausoleum area. Make sure not to kill the boss Mogwin or else they won't spawn in. Continuing on, we still need a weapon for our main hand. We can use the Uchi Katana with the Occult Affinity placed on it. Now with this one, we only get a little passive bleed buildup. It's more of a nice bonus with its physical damage scaling with Arcane and the Ash of War we use. Speaking of that, the Ash of War we can use on this Katana is fully broken in so many ways. Bloodblade. Your character sacrifices a tiny bit of health to shoot out Blades of Blood that not only do good damage alone, but also apply a bleed buildup that stacks exceptionally quickly, and it only costs a tiny bit of health on the first cast. Afterwards, it only consumes 3 mana to chain cast it. Honestly, it's pretty busted. Nevertheless, we can make it even better, and that's with the help of the Shard of Alexander. 
increasing our Ashes of War damage by an extra 15%. This also applies to repeating thrust, hence it's a good talisman all around and highly recommended. The way we use this build is straightforward. With regular to strong enemies, the Katana's basic attack should be more than enough to take them down. And even so, the Ashes of War don't consume a whole lot of mana, so you can use those more freely without worrying about them running out. Finally, when it comes to bosses, the best combo to use is first proccing either a Frost or Bleed buildup with the Ash of War repeating thrust. Again, it should only take 1-3 to three uses to get this off, and then you'll get a huge damage buff. Next, use the Ash of War Bloodblade to melt them down exceptionally quickly. You can also use the Katana's basic attacks because your character will be buffed up after proccing one of these status effects. Now that covers everything for the weapons, so I'll show you where you can find them again before I go over some really easy buffs we can use. For the Uchi Katana, you can pick this up in the Death Touched Catacombs in Limgrave, a simple early game item to get. Afterwards, you can grab the Ash of War Bloodblade rewarded after killing a Teardrop Scarab found in the Altus Plateau area. It'll be hovering above the pond. Next, the Shard of Alexander is given to you after completing the Iron Fist Alexander questline. I suggest finishing this because the Talisman is used in so many builds in general. Now we can move on to the two things we can use to increase our character's overall damage and protection, with the first one being the Ash of War Golden Vow. With this, we can just throw it on the lightest weapon you can find, like a dagger, because it doesn't make any difference at all whether you place it on the biggest weapons in the game or the smallest one. But anyways, it increases our overall damage by 11.5% and damage negation by 7.5%, lasting for 45 seconds. So it's perfect for being infinitely reusable and a very early game item. The second way we can quickly increase our damage and protection is with the Flask of Wondrous Physic. I found the best tiers to be the Dexterity Crystal Knot, increasing our dex by 10 levels. In turn, giving us more damage since whether we use the Cold or Bleed Affinity, it will have a B scaling for dex, and even the Occult Katana gets a bit more as well. Then the second one, you have more of a free choice since there's nothing that will make this build exponentially better. However, I am using the Opaline Heart tier to increase our damage negation by 15% to make us a lot tankier. Both of these tiers last for 3 minutes. If you don't like the Opaline Heart tier, you can easily swap it out for whatever you fancy. It's not going to make a huge difference. And just like before, I'll show you guys where you can find these buffs. With the Ash of War Golden Vow, you can acquire this after defeating a Mounted Godric Knight that roams on the cliffs southwest above the Death Touched Catacombs so you can get the Ash of War and the Katana right after. Next, you can grab the Dexterity Crystal Knot found on a small island in Liurnia of the Lakes. You don't have to kill anything, but it would make it easier. And lastly, for the Opaline Heart tier, you'll have to kill a Putrid Avatar boss near the Minor Erd Tree in Kaled. Moving forward, we still have the armor to look at and the last two talismans to use. Now for me, I went with looks over functionality on this one grabbing the Land of the Reeds armor, which does offer a decent amount of protection. Still, there are some better options, especially for the chest piece. For example, you could throw on the Raptor's Black Feathers, increasing your jumping attack damage by 10%, or the Black Knife armor that silences your character's movement when running and jumping. Both are definitely better options for functionality, however, that's entirely up to you. It won't make a massive difference, yet every little bit does help. Another handy item to this build is the Erdtree's Favor plus 2. This increases our maximum health by 4%, stamina by 9.6, and max equip load by 5. It's excellent all around and helps if you change your armor for something heavier. As usual, I'll show you where you can find these items. To get the Land of the Reeds armor, you'll have to buy it from the vendor sitting in the isolated merchant shack in Kaled, so no fighting is involved. If you choose to go with the Raptor's Black Feathers, you'll find it in the Sage's Cave behind an illusionary wall. Or, if you decide to go with the Black Knife Armor, this one, you'll have to reach the Consecrated Snowfields area and pick it up from a corpse under an archway. Lastly, for the Erdtree's Favor, you'll have to go to Liondel Ashen Capital in a large courtyard. This is more of a late game item, but like the Shard of Alexander, it's worth it being used in tons of builds in general. Coming to the end of the video, we can finish with the minimum stats required. So to use everything effectively in this build, 
you'll need at least 18 strength and 22 dex. Afterwards, I'd recommend putting most of your points into arcane to increase your damage, bleed buildup, and ash of war damage. Then you could put points into dex since that will also increase our basic attack damage on both of our katanas. You don't need to put any levels into mind since, again, the ashes of war we use barely consume any mana. Now the starting character you'll want to use to match this build exactly is the hero class. You could pick the samurai since that comes with some items we use in this build, yet you won't have the exact same stats. For my last talisman, I'm just using Millicent's prosthesis that increases our dex by 5 levels and attack power with successive attacks. It gives us extra damage because of the Ash of War repeating thrust, hitting our target 4 times. Still, it's not anything extraordinary, so feel free to swap this out for whatever you may like more. The only essential talismans that are a must is the Shard of Alexander and the Lord of Blood's Exultation that really impact this build heavily. But to get Millicent's prosthesis, you'll have to kill Millicent, who can be found at the Windmill Heights Site of Grace after defeating the Godskin Apostle boss that stands there. Now that fully covers this entire setup. Before I end the video, I want to thank the members of my channel for supporting me on my videos and the future ones to come. If you guys want to become members, there will be a button at the bottom right of this video to click. If not, no worries, I'm happy you made it to the end of the video. That being said, thanks for watching everyone, and I hope I see you all in the next one.